There we go. There we go. Okay. Continue. That's it. So, um, good morning, Philip Jacobs. <laughs> good morning, Natasha McCarthy. Um, I'm giggling because we tried this at seven o'clock this evening. I had full makeup and everything, and the broadband did not love us, did it? No. So it's now very early in the morning and because <laughs> I go I go to bed so late and you get up so early it's the only time we can meet we've crossed over but we've done away with well I've done away with makeup I don't know if you've got makeup or anything like that but uh I haven't got any makeup <laughs> just your fabulous self oh natural yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um I, I suddenly realized it's been almost three years since we last spoke because I was very pregnant when I last saw you. Yeah, that's when you came down here to my van in yeah. Dorset. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, was, yeah. I, was, I was worried we wouldn't know which was your van. Yeah. And I needn't have worried because there was half a dinosaur outside. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my son still has the vertebrae, the dinosaur vertebrae that you gave him. He's oh, that's nice. one of his most treasured things, and he still wants oh. to be a paleontologist. So, yeah, he has a special he has a special possessions box, doesn't he? Yeah, a yeah, box for special things. Yeah, yeah, he does. And we saw his grandparents for the first time in a year and a half two days ago. Yeah. They bought all of my husband's rocks that he had as well so he's yeah. now the oh. so yeah it's the, the collection is growing he's uh he's nice. a space outside like you've got now to display yes, excellent. Yeah. excellent it's good to have an outdoor display display page yeah so 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 for anybody that's wondering what on earth is going on um a lot of people will know you from the K-Facet Collective and you do run um, the K-Facet Collective Facebook page. Is it 63 or 64,000 members there now? One or two? It's 64,000. 64, and the other day it went up uh, 400 members in four days. So it's, it often goes 100 new members a day. That's and so sometimes you get another thousand in about 10 or 12 days. So for so. anybody that isn't watching from there, maybe hop on and have a look because it's just chocked full of the most beautiful inspiration from the work of the K-Facet Collective. And you man it brilliantly, I have to say, because Kafe doesn't actually know how to turn on a computer, so there'd be absolutely... No, he doesn't. He <laughs> really doesn't. It's me and, me and Liza Lucy who look after it. Yeah, I, I, I started up, started it up, and then Liza came in to help as an ad, another admin to help run it, because on full moons it can get quite troublesome sometimes. <laughs> hey, look, I used to teach, and and it yeah. was a recognised thing that during the full moon there would be yeah. there would be trouble. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> so it is it is a thing. Um yeah. it's funny actually because I know we when we when we tried this interview first time around, we, we were talking about education and um about the fact that at school you didn't think yourself good. And I this blows my mind. Um you didn't think yourself good at anything other than painting. I mean, thank goodness you thought yourself good at painting, but you didn't think yourself good at anything other than painting. Well, I can tell a story around that because when my mother was looking for my, um, what you call the public school to go to, mm. and, and I wasn't um, academic enough to get into my brother's school, which was St. John's Leatherhead. And there was another um, really expensive school called Millfield, which would take um either very rich people or very talented people and we didn't have any money because my father had died my mother was bringing up three children supporting us all uh, by being a nurse so and the headmaster said well Millfield's all very well but you need a special talent and what's Philip got to offer absolutely nothing so 
<laughs> oh, eat your words. Yeah. No. What, what, what we were saying earlier, what I was saying is the Western education system, particularly back in those days, I don't know what it's like now, is really geared to producing university professors. So it's all based around academia. Yeah. And if you're not academic, if you're um, left brain rather than right brain, then you have a terrible time at school. Because if you're no good at Latin and you're no good at physics and you're no good at maths um, and you're no good at quite a few other things, then you, you just get branded a dunce. And and that, you're... Has that stayed with you? No, it hasn't. <laughs> thank goodness, thank goodness. I was going to say, because you know more about astronomy and historical facts. You dig for dinosaurs. You are an authority on them. You've found an entire dinosaur, which you then floated, um, floated out and up and is now in a museum. Um, which you've kindly gifted. You know so much about paleontology. Um, you look for war memorabilia, so your historical facts are spot on. Um, uh, it blows my mind how much you know. You've written books that are pretty much on philosophy, and yet that school had the nerve not to, and we haven't even touched on your artistic skills. And yet that school called you a dunce. Shame on them. Yeah. Shame yeah. on them. I mean, you said very quickly, it, but... it, it didn't, it didn't bother me at all. I was, I was quite happy in that position. Um, Cause I was, I always sort of followed the things I was interested in. And. Um, was that with your mother's guidance? My mother just sort of watched on, really. She encouraged individuality mm -hmm. and she loved antiques and old things. So um, money didn't impress her at all and academia didn't impress her at all. So we were encouraged to be very individual. So I was able to follow my own career in the arts and I know Recently, I think in the pandemic, Rishi Sunak was suggesting that some artists might retrain um, as something else. To do what? If you're well, they could be a, they, they, could, they could be accountants <laughs> or tax inspectors. But yeah, my point, yeah. my, my whole my whole point is that as an artist, I earn quite a lot more than Rishi Sunak does as Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there for any any would-be artists. But it's actually a very worthwhile profession. I think it's one of those things, if you have a calling for the arts, um, and I know that for me, my mother struggled with this because I trained as an actor and she didn't want mm. for me as a profession because she said it's so tough. There's so much rejection. People say nasty stuff about you, um, mm. especially with social media. But you can't help it. If it's what you want to do, it's what mm. you want to do. And the very mm. first time that, that you within social media ever came on my radar... I have to, I will be honest, um, mm. I, I didn't think it could be you. And I had to go and check because I was like, what's Philip Jacobs doing commenting on my Facebook? Uh, yes, I, I remember. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is a fake account, surely. Um, but I, I, think I, saw, I, I think I saw you, I think you'd interviewed Kay for your talk yeah. to him. Yeah. And I saw you and I was impressed with, the way you interviewed him so I then looked up and found your Facebook account yeah and I remember you writing it stuck with me because I remember you writing this woman has found her bliss and yeah. and you're right you are yeah. right in fabric and and this side of things it absolutely suits um but it wasn't ever offered at school um and interestingly, out of the K Facet Collective, I was giving this some thought earlier. There's you that was told you were, you know, a dunce in your words. Yeah. 
there's Brandon, who was not an achiever at school. His dyslexia no. got in his way massively. And Kate yeah. couldn't quite decide what he wanted to be. Maybe he wanted to be an actor. Maybe he wanted to be a painter, but sort of yeah. not struggled as a painter, but it, I think he felt he needed to be a painter. And then when he Kate. found knitting, ah, yeah. that side that really grabbed him. Yeah, Kate um, ran away from Keith ran away from art college. Yeah. He didn't like it. He didn't like it, so he ran away. I think they tried to tell him what to do. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got three gentlemen who have followed their own path, done their own individual thing, and really found your bliss. You know, all three of you, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hadn't realised until earlier when we were talking that you'd actually worked with Kaif back in the 70s. I knew you knew each other then, but hadn't realized yeah. that we'd worked together. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you about that. It was, as I told you before, I met him at this society where we do sacred dances. And I can actually remember 1973, there was his movements to music class. And I remember walking into my first class and there were three people over by the grand piano. There was this tall bearded man, a shorter bearded man and a, a girl. And the tall bearded man was Keith. And I walked across to the piano and started talking to them. So they became my friends. And then when I left, left art college three years later in 1976, Keith was doing a collection of furnishing fabrics for Designers Guild. And he didn't really know how to put them in repeat because he had just offered up some of his sketches to Trisha Guild. And he'd say, no, 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 they need to be technically put in repeat. So Keith asked me if I'd put them in repeat for him. And because I'd just finished my degree course in textiles, I knew exactly how to how to paint them up in repeat. I'm so giggling. I worked with because I don't think it wasn't even so much that he didn't know how to present them. I think one of them he'd actually done on sort of a cardboard or something because he didn't like the texture. That's it. I took them off the <laughs> his sketches off the cardboard and repainted them <laughs> with in repeat lines, working fully in repeat. I'm sure now, now he's very good at putting things in repeat. Yeah, but I've that, seen his that, workbooks that, and they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, he didn't know how to. But why would he? You know, he'd never done it before. And, no, and there's only one way no. to learn. And thank goodness he had you to, to steer him right. So yeah. going back to school, you ended, you, your mother found you um, a boarding school that, that, yeah. would, that would have someone like you. <laughs> yeah. And do you, do you still remember the art teacher that said, well, actually, you know, you're, you're pretty good at this painting. Um, yeah, it was a, it was an art teacher called Bill Wiley, um, and I was the only person who did A level art art at school. So, and once you got in the sixth form, you could arrange all your sort of classes how you wanted. So I turned every single lesson almost into a, a an art lesson. So I just used to go up straight. I had my own room by that time up in the top of his huge great mansion. And I just used to paint all day or go off walking in the woods or go off meeting my hippie friends out in out in the woods who lived nearby. And we'd have bonfires and mantra chanting sessions out in the woods. Could you imagine that being allowed today? I mean, as much as, <laughs> uh, you know, it just, it blows my mind. It's hilarious. But it, it is, it's one of those things that the school was in a way quite progressive because they saw that you had an interest in meditation. And, and like you say, by this time, your father had passed and, mm. and they let you go to London on mm. your own. Yeah. Your meditation groups, phenomenal. Yeah, my mother had to write them a letter saying she agreed for me to go. And my mother actually didn't want me to go. But I said to my mother, I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> so if you if you don't write permission, I'm going to get into big trouble. 
so she reluctantly wrote a letter to the headmaster saying I grant Philip permission to go and learn to meditate in London so off I went and was that, that was nine was that the that was nine <laughs> <laughs> that was 1971 that was and was that the start of your time with the whirling dervishes yeah it was a society in london called the study society and it had a number of different disciplines that come from different parts of the world and one of them was um meditation from the indian advaita or non-dual tradition and another was the um Mevlevi Dervish whirling, whirling Dervish ceremony from Turkey mm. and another was a series of sacred dances from various different countries in the Far East and Middle East and other things too and so Kate and I first met at the movements they were called they were the sacred dances but Kate was already had already learned the whirling dervish dance there so I didn't learn that till 1976 which is right at the end of my art college course it's very physically demanding yeah <laughs> isn't it i mean to, yeah. to be able, just to be able to hold your arms out for any length of time because it is it's a it's a whole arm out and and, and twirling right did you i know that Kafe learned with a nail between his toes to yeah on the spot which sounds horrendous. Did you did you learn that yeah. way as well? Yeah, that's the traditional Mevlevi Turkish way of learning it. The net is not really a nail, it's like a sort of brass bullet. And you put it between your big toe and the next toe. And that gives you what's known as your pillar, which is yeah. your still center, which runs right up through your body. And once you've got that, then the whole turn happens around your still center. And it's both your sort of physical still center and your psychological still center. So yeah. when you're turning in this busy ceremony, you're very um, still. It, it, it's phenomenal and really, really beautiful to watch. Actually, it's it's quite stunning. It's phenomenal to watch. It's um, in the Mevlevi tradition, the watchers are called lovers. So then they're actually part, part of the ceremony. <clears throat> so when you're watching it, then you get this amazing energy comes off the dancers and you feel amazingly happy just watching it. And you are actually still a part of, of that group, aren't you? Yeah. When um, the head of the tradition is known as the Sheikh, and when I learned it, the Sheikh was a man called Dr. Francis Rawls. Then he handed over when he died to a Norwegian man who had been in, in the Norwegian resistance in World War II, and he was called Willem Koren. Mm -hmm. And Willem then handed over to me as the Sheikh. So, um, although now it's actually not happening, there's a small a part of it's happening on Zoom just for people to practice but the actual ceremony can't happen really until covid has passed because it would be too much of a it could be a spreader because you're all whirling and yeah yeah um, yeah. And yeah so has covid has it had a huge impact i mean i've followed you on social media throughout covid and it it looks from the outside and I am very aware that you know Facebook could also be known as fake book um yeah but it looks from the outside as though you know you've done all right I've had a really good time through the Covid lockdowns um the only thing because I'm not a person who goes out to restaurants hardly of a theatre anyway mm. um so the dervishes has ceased um, but that's all right, that will come back at some point. But the rest of my life, I love sitting in one of my studios painting. Um, when I couldn't come down to Dorset, when we were all locked in our own primary locations, that mm. I wanted to be here last spring, this time a year ago, we were all locked down in London. 
I was still enjoying myself because I was doing lovely designs. I was painting up for the KFC. And now I'm back here by the sea. It's absolute bliss because I can just paint and then walk off down to the sea and look for my badges in the hedgerows and um, all the things I like doing, going looking for fossils. And I only dig up bombs because the caravan site is actually on a World War II um, firing range. It's a pra World War II practice <laughs> range. And I, I, I love archaeology, so I just walk around picking up um, old bits of militaria from uh, the 1940s. I just find it interesting. Now, I know when, um, when I originally spoke to you, you said something that stuck to me, and, and that is that, and it was actually with regard to the fossils, when you go fossil hunting, that it's, it's like you switch your brain to filter out other things and just kind of find the fossils. Is that the same with the, with the World War II memorabilia? Is that? It's just the same. With dinosaurs, you switch your brain on to, it's like it's got a sort of sensor and you're just picking out these brown speckly bones, dinosaurs. When I'm looking for fossilized sea urchins called echinoids, then I sort of turn on the echinoid filter in my brain. And that's what I see. When I'm walking along the Thames foreshore, and then I turn on my clay tobacco pipe filter, and you see all these old clay tobacco pipes. When I'm out in the fields here, I'm both looking for large ammonites, which you get in the ploughed, big ploughed field down there called Shrapnel Hill. Um, and then also I'm looking for little brown bits of rusty metal sticking up. And the rusty metal can be something really sort of like a, a mortar bomb or an anti-tank shell or something. Did you not have to get the bomb disposal unit out for one? Yeah, we got them out in December. I found two um, high explosive uh, two inch British Army mortar rounds. And so once I'd, I had to work out, once I'd realised, I dug them out and I examined them and I thought, yeah, that's high explosive. Still live. Um, yeah. Still live. Having a good so day. Yeah. yeah. So I had a wonderful day with the army. <laughs> and they came down, they let me come in to the field with them. They showed me how them wrapping the explosive round, they tied the two morph bombs together. Then they wrapped this sort of plastic explosive round it. Then they had a long a fuse which burnt very quickly and it attached to another fuse which they then wheeled away it was electric with on a sort of cable and then we were all at a safe distance me and the two soldiers and two policemen and then they detonated it and this huge great explosion went up in the field and that was that was a lovely day <laughs> it's <pretty laughs> tough up it's fine uh, average day in the life of lockdown for Philip Jackson no yeah. we've had a great time um yeah. because it's, it's fair to say that when you left school um and you went off to art college you, you know you you toyed with the idea of going into the army I did yeah that was um when I was much younger up till about the age 12 or 13 I was planning to go to Sandhurst and mm -hmm. do officer training. I think it's because I grew up soon after the Second World War and I watched all the war films like Guns of Navarone and Lawrence of Arabia and everything. And um, I sort of just love adventure like that. So I love outdoor adventure. And I had lots of mentors who were old colonels um, who used to take an interest in me and give me uh, their medals and things. So, but then um, hippiedom came along. Um, and then I realized I wasn't really cut out for the army after all. And then art career took over. So you head off to art, art school. So you did a year's foundation. Yeah. And then had to decide what you wanted to to focus on and they got quite excited because well this is a this is a, a man that could be good at textiles that was it yeah that was mr hemingsley anthony hemingsley 
he was both a graphic designer and a textile designer. And my mother thought I should do graphics because she thought, because I love painting these huge psychedelic pictures. Um, and she didn't think that you could really earn your living as a fine artist. Most, a lot of fine artists end up being teachers as well as yeah. artists. Yeah. Or te teaching in art colleges. And, but Mr. Hemingsley spotted my, I was, loved copying Japanese prints and Tibetan tanker paintings. And Mr. Hemingsley said, we've got a rare phenomena here a man who would be good at textiles. <laughs> he's, I mean, he's not wrong. He's, he's not no, wrong. No, he got Absolutely. it right with Mr. Hemingsley. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Mr. Hemingsley. Um, yeah. What struck me was that you didn't actually spend much of your time doing textile drawings. You sort of went off to the Malvern Hills instead and did landscapes. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get away with that? Um, in <clears throat> on my course at Hornsey, not many of the tutors really knew much about textiles, strangely. They were all into sort of experimental art. And so what they used to do is just um, say, tell me to go off to the, the Malvins where I had friends and do landscape paintings. And then I used to come back and try and using the silk silk screen process i'd turn my paintings into huge great textile murals oh wow I'd sort of build up layer and layer of textures and but i didn't really it wasn't really till my degree show in 1976 just before it i thought i'd better paint up a few textile designs i mean it would have yeah, one thing, the external invigilator on my degree course, <coughs> which is in Liberties, she said to me, you won't actually ever be a textile designer, will you? You're destined to be a fine artist. So she got that wrong. I, I love all these opinions that people put on you, you know, yeah. you're this, you're that, you'll never be this, you'll never be that. Um, I think it takes a very... Oh, and, and so here comes my opinion, obviously, on top of all of those, that yeah. it, it takes someone of a strong will and character to, to, to do what they love and go, well, yeah. this is what I love doing, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. Did you ever I waver? No. I've got a very stubborn nature, which, which really? helps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, what what my head head of department at Hornsey did say to me, he said, your method is so good because you just go on and persist that you can't fail to in the end to get success. That's what he said to me. He said, you're bound to succeed because you just plug away at it. So he got that right. And you did plug away at it. And when when I was, I like I like to do a little bit of research before these things. And it struck me. Um, I I like to collect the sample books from. Yeah. Um, and when when you were saying all the people that you had worked for. Because it's very easy to just shoot, oh yeah, no, oh, oh Philip Jacobs, yeah, no, he's he's the K Facet Collective. But actually, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. You oh. know, the, the number of people that you've worked with, pretty much every top brand of interior design firm. Oh. Is, yeah, if you look there. at yeah, I've it's got amazing. it all on my my LinkedIn profile. Most of the people I've worked for, there's even some I've. I think I've forgotten to put on, but it's it's nearly everyone. Yeah, yeah, just just incredible. I mean, a a real wow, a, a real wow career. It, it's just oh. it's just incredible. So, out of art college, you worked with Cave for a couple of weeks, showing yeah. what was what, and then you had. Uh, you got an agent, didn't you? Straight, straight out. I got of an agent. Yeah. He met me at Liberties, 
he was a nice fellow called Barry Daniels and he asked if he could take my work to America and um, France and places and so I, he started sort of guiding me and telling me what to paint up and I very rapidly discovered that if I painted flowers, that they sold better than geometrics. Okay. So I started going in a, in a floral direction. And once I started painting them, then I wanted to start growing the flowers as well. So the sort of floral and botanical interest started to grow. Mm. Which presumably um fell in with your love of the British countryside absolutely yeah win-win so there was a book which came out in 1978 which really inspired me called the country diary of an Edwardian lady mm. which was very famous back then and there was beautiful illustrations all through the year watercolors of British wildflowers and um, butterflies and a bit of landscape and that really in helped inspire my design work because I was very much sort of wildflower orientated at that time. And later on, I got into garden flowers and such I mean, like. Your flowers are phenomenal. And I know that you've told me off because I'm like, this guy is pretty much a botanical artist. And I know you've sort of said, no, 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 I am. I'm a fabric artist. That's what I do. But I mean, they are just stunning. Yeah, with that, with that, where you said I was a botanical artist, I only corrected you because it sounded like I was someone who's, who was a botanical painter who happened to try textiles, whereas I'm just um, a dyed-in-the-wool textile designer because that's all I've trained at and that's all I've ever done professionally. Whose botanicals are sublime. I mean, it just... Yeah. My work is very, very botanical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It was it was meant as a compliment. It just because yeah. it, you know, the florals are ah, oh, they're, they're they're always stand out. They're just always absolutely, absolutely stunning, and um, yeah. and they will always get a comment if I ever make anything with any of yours in. Um, you know, out of all the designers, I mean, we're we're really lucky living in an age with a with a lot of talent out there. Yeah, but yeah. If there's if there's a bit of Philip Jacobs in there, it will always it'll always get a comment, you know, always. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you you you're out of art college. Barry's helping you get your work out there, um, and you're having some success. This is this is good. It's paying my uh, rent initially. Yeah. Yep, some so, artists would be thrilled with that as just a, <laughs> yeah. as just a life hooray. Yeah. I was just I was just sort of earning my living just. But then with Barry, I was doing it was mostly dress fabrics and bedding. And I didn't actually have much of a personal interest in dress fabrics and bedding. And I thought I'd really love to get into furnishing fabrics. Because um, I really admired William Morris and other people like that. And I thought, I want to be more like William Morris. And so I started pulling away from the agent, from Barry. And I started painting up designs which would be suitable for furnishings. And I started ringing up the furnishing companies or writing them letters and sending them photographs and setting up meetings with them. So that was early 1980s. And I'm writing all these letters to all these different companies. And I then started to get first just a small amount of work with Sanderson and Osborne and Little. And then it gradually spread more and more into people like Warners and a company called Seckers and Bakers. And then there was this company I hadn't seen before called Ram, Sun and Crocker. Hmm. And they a big company back in the late 19th century originally they were part of Warner's it was called Warner Ram then Mr Ram and Mr Warner then went their separate ways and Ram, Sun and Crocker had sort of almost died out in the late 50s early 60s and a couple of uh, men had bought it 
with a backer and it was just being built up again. And I sent my letter to them because I saw their advert in World of Interiors, their first advert, and we really hit it off. And I ended up becoming design director of Ram, Sun and Crocker for about 17 years. And, and you, was... you worked all hours for them, didn't you? All hours, yeah. I worked because um, we were so popular because we were supplying all the American companies with their chintzes mm -hmm. and so all the big American companies like Brunswick and Lee Jafer and Schumacher and everyone else we were supplying a lot of their we were selling them our fabrics and designs and so um, the managing director was a fellow called Keith Lamborn who was very nice and he had ginger hair so I called he said to me, I don't mind what you call me as long as you don't call me Ginger. Oh, well, that's like uh, a red rag to a bull, isn't it? Yeah. He became Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> but Gin Ginger, in his selling, he used to get a bit carried away because he'd very good salesman and he'd say to the American company, oh, yes, we'll have these, this collection ready for you in a month's time. And then that would all be put back on me. Yeah. And I was just completely overwhelmed working all hours, painting up all these collections. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. at, at some point, um, at some point, the body says no, doesn't it? Yeah, the body kind of says tough. no. Um, and I think I'd, it's sort of, I'm difficult to know exactly what I got because I'd, had multiple tick bites when I used to be out fossil hunting yeah. in Hampshire where I was living I was always pulling ticks off myself and I started to get r rashes up both legs but when I went to the doctor I just got sent away because they didn't know what it was and then about six months to a year later I developed like a non-stop flu which I just couldn't shake off. I had a sore throat for about six months and low temperature. And then I went back to the doctor again. We never sort of connected it with the tick bite. And they sent me to an ENT specialist. And the ENT specialist whipped my tonsils out. But no one ever did a blood test, which I, now looking back on it was very a remiss, I think. And I was okay for a little while. And then the flu came back and then it felt like the flu went in deep inside. Hmm. And then I got in a state where I could barely hold my body upright. I had so little energy and um, sore throats. And I couldn't sleep at all. Like you, I've, I haven't had that much sleep in the last 30 years. But... Um, and my doctor brother then diagnosed ME uh, and I realised I'd completely burnt out doing all these en endless collections. But and you didn't body... stop, did you? You used to prop yourself up so that you yeah. didn't expand any energy in sitting yeah. so that you could yeah. still paint. Yeah, I carried on for about, uh, five, six, about five years with it, propping myself up and still doing all the collections because Ginger was still selling the designs. And I did was you realise how unwell you were? He did. He was very sympathetic. And as I got iller, we had other freelancers we would employ. And so I would only do what I, I could do after that. Wow. And, then... and then the world changes, doesn't it? And And you know chint starts to be oh wow well, why would you want chintz? Yeah. and recession yeah, yeah. Chuck, chuck out your chintz was the uh, catchphrase that was that swedish company what are they called them um, what are they called that one with does the flat packs oh ikea ikea they had the phrase chuck out your chintz that was early 90s so chintz goes completely out of fashion. So what I'm doing for Rams um, starts 
to sell less and less and less. And then eventually I'm let go of. And so I suddenly find myself with no income at all. <laughs> yeah, the, no, the, uh, the royalties for your fabrics, does that, does that stop? They all, they all stop. It was probably a bad contract on my part, um, but my royalties all ended with um, if I was no longer an employee. Ouch. Ouch. Uh, so I, I ended up with no health and no income. Wow. Wow. That's really, really harsh. Now that, that, that would, that would do a lot to some people, but like you say, you are stubborn. And I think probably in saying, well, you know, five years of ME and propping yourself. I mean, that, that to me speaks volumes. There is, yeah, you, you don't, you don't fall over easy, do you? But um, no, no. So it's fair to say, and I love your story of the frog in milk. Yeah. And I, this is, for me, this is like, this is the frog in milk years. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in, in being so ill and realizing that you needed to rest and get better and sleep and heal. Yeah. You, did, people can go in different directions at that point. And am I right in thinking that's the time that you you wrote your books? I wrote my books and I started hunting for dinosaurs big time. So because I was living in a cottage in Hampshire, hmm. a rent, little rented cottage on a farm, very nice. And I would had a nice greenhouse. So I turned my greenhouse into a writing room and I would didn't do any designing at all hardly and then I found that I could drive off down to Kimmeridge and walk along a beach and I started picking up these lovely bones so that became like a, it was like a sort of intermediary life it was like the big first career had ended and I was in this sort of about seven years of limbo hmm. um, where I didn't know what direction my life was going to go in. I didn't know if textiles was over or if something else was going to emerge or if I was going to become a full-time writer or what was going to happen. So, But I remembered, as you said, the story of the two frogs in the milk and the lazy frog, he says, we're lost and he sinks to the bottom and drowns. But the other frog goes on kicking and kicking until the milk turns into butter and out he hops. So at a certain point, um, I suddenly thought I've got to be like the frog and I'm gonna just start quietly designing on my own. I don't have the energy <clears throat> to lug my portfolio around. I just can't physically do it. But I'm just gonna very quietly start painting and see what happens. And that was the start of the frog kicking. Yeah. And it, it struck me that we take for granted now the internet and all that technology that means that actually we can see your designs all over the world. But actually, it was still a case of this is my art portfolio and either having photographs of them, which isn't cheap either, and, and sending mm. those off mm. um, with, you know, with a letter. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. snail mail and all, all those sorts of things so it's not it's not a matter of just send firing off a few a few emails to to mm -hmm. get interest there's proper yeah. legwork has to happen a lot of legwork I had that in the very early days the early 80s when I was trying to find the furnishing companies you do an awful lot of wandering around London lugging this very sort of heavy portfolio around with you and going and seeing these people and more often than not coming in a way disappointed because they haven't bought anything so I didn't have the energy to go back to that I'd been in the furnishing world I'd been at the top of my career I'd been design director of a very well respected company and my designs were all over the world and and in the White House 
and in the White and House. And in the White House, yeah. 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 Uh, but suddenly I found myself back with zero income and not the energy to rebuild it all. So I needed the resting period before I was ready to sort of begin again. Would those books have ever happened if you hadn't have had that period, almost a reflection? I don't think they would have done. It was me, it's because I was assimilating the whole process of life and how life builds up and then suddenly it all collapses and you have to process your experience because what you don't know at the time, what I didn't know is it was all going to build up again and the second career was going to be better than the first career. The second design career is way better than the Ram Sun and Crocker furnishings. And did you have that faith that it could be there again? I had it in part of me. Part of me thought it was going to be. Part of me doubted because it looked so impossible. I thought there's no longer a furnishing industry. It's virtually crumbled. Mm. No one wants floral chintzes anymore. All they want is beige sofas and mm. and blinds mm. <laughs> and a big and a big television. Mm. Um era of huge great curtains and um floral sofas and stuff had all disappeared. So I couldn't logically see how it could possibly revive itself i didn't i tried different furnishing companies there was um i gradually started to do work for people like sanderson's and andrew martin who was very big at the time and probably is still quite big and um, he's a very nice man martin waller um but it wasn't it was just a bit of work here and a bit of work there. It wasn't like a, a, a fantastic career. But, but stuff starts to happen again. Now, um, you are a world authority on, on a few things <laughs> and um, antique uh, florals and, and fabrics is is one of them specifically French, if I got that right? Or... Specifically French. I'm very good on English. 1850s, sort of second half of the 19th century, French floral chintz, English floral chintz and fabrics. I'm brilliant on. I can put everything, but I can really do it from 1850 to the present day. I can put everything within a 10 year slot normally. Very, very often I can identify the, the manufacturer and the place it was made and so on. So when Sanderson wanted a print from you, they would come down and you had at this stage, you had a, a stable, uh, yeah. literally a stable full, yeah. full of these antique designs. So how does that work? Would they pick one and you redesign it? They would come down and look at my archive and go through and find a lovely bit of old floral tints. And they'd normally say, oh, we, we'd really love you to paint that up, but we want it sort of slightly differently and that flower there and that flower there. So that was how it worked. And also uh, other people came down like uh, Colfax and Fowler. Mm -hmm. And presumably there's no copyright on these on these old no. ones so they no none, none at all everything after a certain amount of time everything goes into the public domain yeah so like anyone could produce a volume of shakespeare for instance you just do your own edition of it yeah and with with printed textiles it certainly was at the time it was copyright only lasted about 25 years i think Wow. And after that, it goes into the public domain and anyone can do it. So that's why anyone can produce a William Morris fabric. Anyone can. You can't use the word William Morris because that is copyrighted as a trademark by Morris and Co. But anyone can put a Morris design, can print it as fabric or have it on 
a box or t-shirt or anything because it's yeah. out of copyright I think they they tried I think they tried with the wallpapers to say they were works of art or something I think they, they tried yeah. to get around it somehow so that they said yeah. good which you would you know yeah absolutely absolutely um so Sanderson um, and various others start to take an interest and you have sort of a seven year, seven year, not lull exactly, but a change of pace, shall we yeah. say. Um, yeah. and, and the philosophical books are written. Yeah. Yeah. Which are, which are fascinating. Um, is there going to be another book? Yes. Yes. Um, I've been working on my autobiography, mm -hmm. which um, it's more or less finished, except uh, there might be another chapter, because as you go on living, it'd be quite good to have... <laughs> you do more stuff! <laughs> yeah, it'd be, good to, it'd be good to have a chapter called The Covid Years. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, it is... Cause, cause it is quite, quite an interesting, period of time. It's an interesting historical period of time, so nice to record it so I might have to do another chapter but that's um it has the whole of my design career but it has all uh what I've learned in terms of philosophy and so on with my teachers mm. so it's more I would say spiritual autobiography it's not really a craft book at all so publisher wise it would in a way it falls between two tables um because it's not craft book but it's more spiritual biography so I doubt it will be a big glossy book like Kaif's autobiography it'd be more a book for people to read the words of I think yeah yeah anyway so that's yeah. that's being prepared oh fantastic oh, I can't wait oh it's yeah your your philosophy is it, it it's yeah it's it's really moving if you could oh it's like trying to put the universe in a in a jam jar um but it for anyone that that hasn't looked at any of your work is is there sort of a a way that you could sum up your 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 sort of give it a tag almost a tagline of your yeah, tagline yeah yeah I could, I could definitely do a tagline it would be something like in your life, whatever it looks like, don't worry. Everything is actually being taken care of. Mm -hmm. It may not look like it. You may not know it, but you're absolutely fine. Underneath, everything is absolutely fine. Don't worry at all. Yeah. You're absolutely yeah. fine. So that's the tagline. It's so true. I have a little reminder that flashes up on my phone every day that, you know, life is absolutely perfect and puts you where you need to be. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm with yeah. you on that completely. Yeah. Well, that's a great tagline. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so you are the frog kicking and, uh, yeah. and you're, you're churning, churning your butter and, um, yeah. and how do you eventually hop out of this seven year well, what, what happens is I get thrown out of the house I'm living in. It's again appeared to be a huge trauma. I thought, oh my God, because my mother had died and we'd sold our, our family home, but it was before the property boom. Mm. And in any way, it was divided between us three siblings. And then five years after that, I just I was living on my savings on the interest on them because I was hardly earning anything. And then I got thrown out of my cottage. I just came back one day and there was a letter on the doormat. And I'd been there 17 years. And so I didn't know where to go. I couldn't afford any other rent. And um, so I went and, and down. My brother had just split up with his partner down in and they rented a big farmhouse in Dorset. So I moved into the farmhouse my brother was renting. And I hadn't been there more than about two months. And he's a doctor with a, a clinic. He specializes in alternative medicine yeah. mainly. Yeah. And then one day at about tea time, he came in and 
he brought Keith and Richard. He said, they've come to my clinic and I brought them back for tea. And Keith came into my studio and started seeing the things I was working on for people like Sanderson. And Keith said, ooh, um, I'm, uh, I think he said he was design director of a, a company called Westminster Fibres, hmm. which was doing hmm. patchwork quilting. And they were looking for new designers. And he said, can I take some photographs of your work and take it out to show them in America? So I later on, I prepared him some photographs and sent them to him. And he took them out to America with him. And the people at Westminster Fibers really liked what they saw. So then <coughs> um, Keith and Brandon started, they would come down to Dorset, to, I'd meet them in Salisbury, at Salisbury Station, and I'd drive them to the farmhouse. And then Keith would pick designs out of my archive in the same way that Sanderson's and Colfax and Fowler and other people had. And then I would paint up a collection for Keith as he had sort of indicated. And very rapidly, it, they started selling really well mm. within the patchwork quilting market and after a while I started to notice which ones were selling well so I would then just paint away anyway so I would paint up lovely big sumptuous things which I thought he would like so he was no longer picking telling me what to do but I was um, going on experience of what was selling to draw up the most spectacular designs I could possibly think of for quilting and that was how the frog climbed out of the milk because that gradually built Keith said to me once very early on he said this could be very big for you and that was how it happened it just because around about that time the internet was coming in and I suddenly started discovering I was sort of everywhere on the internet which was quite a surprise to me so um, are we are we about early two thousands now? We're we're about two thousand and six, okay. two thousand and seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I think that's the first time that I've heard you uh have someone say this could be big for you rather than you won't do this and you won't do that. How yeah. lovely! Yeah. How lovely! Yeah. yeah. They, yeah, yeah. they said this this could be very big for you and Keith came down to me once I mean he might have been exaggerating he said to me do you realize we two have the biggest thing in quilting fabric I mean he's not wrong <laughs> I think what was what was different is before Keith quilting fabric had been mostly very tiny little tiny little patterns little dots and little florals and Keith when he originally started quilting with Liza Lucy they were using furnishing fabrics because they wanted huge great blooms yeah in the quilts like they did in 19th century quilts well that was his inspiration wasn't it with the antique yeah. books much like yourself he went he went back to that and, and found those yeah but couldn't find them yeah so Keith and Liza because they couldn't find them, they had to create them themselves. And in bringing me in, they were bringing the person who was an expert at floral floral furnishing yeah. fabrics. Yeah. So it all fitted in like a jigsaw perfectly. Yeah. I mean, they couldn't and have felt better, really. Yeah. Now we have this wonderful, wonderful brand with a world, worldwide following. Of 64,000 and growing by the day, which is yes. just... Uh, just amazing and watch out for the full moons yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um and Westminster Fibres were they part of the, part of Rowan they was there was Rowan Yarn and Westminster Fibres I think Rowan and Westminster Fibres were together yeah 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 Liza knows more than this and she might correct me but I think they were bought by Coat Coats. Oh, Do you remember Coats? Coats? Cotton. Yeah. Yeah, Coats by Ella, they were once. Huge, great cotton manufacturers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rowan and in America and 
Westminster fibres were owned by Coates. And that carried on for quite some time until jumping ahead just three years ago, Coates suddenly closed it all down. And so we got an e I got an email, all the designers did one day three years ago. This was that spring. When, free, when Free Spirit was then sold? Yeah, yeah, Free Spirit was part of it. There was, um, so I think Westminster Fibers had bought Free Spirit at a certain point. And Liza said to me after I got the letter, I rang Liza up, she hadn't heard. I said, we've, we've lost, it's all disappeared. And Liza said to me, do you um, trust me? I said, yep. They lied and said, I'll, I'll find us the next person. Don't, don't worry. <clears throat> and virtually, she said, virtually every textile company was trying to obtain, they wanted us, the KFC. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. And so we, we were able to dictate terms to some degree. But the one lies have then, within a few days, messaged me quite excitedly to say this very nice company called Jaff text we're in negotiations with and she said they're very altruistic and they do lots of charity work and they give lots of stuff away um to people who can't afford sewing machines and things and in going with them it also kept the whole of free spirit together so all the studio and the office were all transferred fully as a going concern um, into Jaftex, which has been wonderful. And the people who write, it's a family run business. Mm. And there's a the father called Robert. And then there's Scott and Greg. Yes. And they're all really lovely. And they're such lovely people to work with. Um, it was a fantastic outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of jumped ahead a bit, possibly there. Well, I was going to say because so your involvement with the K Facet Collective has um, meant that you do two collections for them a year, and yeah. uh, and you have what is lovingly known as Cave's Christmas, where because yeah. I assume yeah. you must when I first sort of started getting into into your fabrics, I. I assume that you must all work really closely together, but it's really not the case. You see them for a few hours a year. It's about one hour a year, one yeah. hour. It's because we don't need to work together because I'm busy painting away on my own all the time. Mm. I'm fully in tune with what Kate's doing. And I'm also fully in tune with what the market wants. So yeah. I, know, I know what's gonna sell. I know what's going to be a really classic design. So all the time we need, me and Cave need together, we don't even talk the rest of the time. We just need that one hour together yeah. for me to take my great big portfolio along. And I, I put the design, <coughs> designs in a very special order. So I'm showing him one at a time. And they're all, he might not know this, but I've done it very carefully. Maybe it's the newer ones at the top. <laughs> I'm showing them, him the most spectacular first to try and wow him. And then we go through the folio once, then we go back through it and he has a maybe pile. Yeah. And a no, not this time pile. So we put so many onto the maybe pile. And then we go, through the maybe pile again and we spread them out on the floor and Brandon's there and Richard Womersley who's his business manager and Helen and I try and influence him as much as I can because I've got a very strong idea of what I want him to do at this stubborn streak yep yeah it's my stubborn streak so I say no 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 <laughs> go for that I think you should do that one and that one and that one and eventually we come to an agreement on it. But Keith is also, he's very stubborn, but he knows exactly what, he knows exactly what he's after. Yeah. So even Bra Brandon has, I've noticed Brandon will say, what about that one, Keith? And Keith will say, no, no, no. So Keith has the final say, 
and he knows he's very particular on what he wants but if he wavers and I'll say I think you should go for that one and how many chances do you give him with with your favorites before you're like right I'll have that myself I'm giving him the initial portfolio has about 30 designs in it hmm. and he's hmm. going to pick six for a year's collection and with some of them he's seen them 10 times so 10 years of looking at the same design and suddenly he picks it with some designs I think that should be a cave so I leave it in there mm. with others yeah. which he's ignored persistently I'll take out and put into Snow Leopard my other brand yeah 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 but, so we'll, we'll get on to that in in just one yeah. moment so he has he gets he he gets a, a few goes at at these fabrics and then yeah and, and then that's that and then cave will then do i guess the thing is then in any collaboration there's going to be one person that then pulls the whole thing together which is yeah. effectively cave because he then does the colorways on yours so he and brandon work and live together so you know they they already know what colorways are, are, are working but he'll then take yours and do do his color magic um, yeah the guy's a genius um and and so i guess yeah he 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 has that in his head he knows that full that full collection it's it's astonishing yeah yeah i've got a, a box of case and uh, my case february 22 is on its way to me now from Korea. It arrives on Tuesday, I think. Yeah, so good luck with that. Because none of the delivery times have have been <laughs> quite <laughs> quite where they should be. Yeah. But it's it's left it's left Seoul in South Korea, and it's FedEx say it's scheduled to be delivered to me here on Tuesday. So I'm looking for, and I I had no idea what case colors are like on this. It's recolors of older designs. Oh wow! Every twenty-two, but that will be here in a few days' time. Oh, how very exciting! So that's very my exciting. Christmas. That's my yeah. Christmas is seeing what Kate's done. Amazing! That takes a lot of trust um, to hand over your artwork to somebody else and allow them to to do the colorway. I know he's not the first person that's that's done your colorways, but it. It still, it still says a lot. I think it's just I, he's so good that there's no worry or doubts at all in my mind. It will be brilliant. Mm. Is the way he can put colours together just staggers me. It's phenomenal. Mm. It's yeah. a unique, unique skill he has. Yeah, Brandon says it's like he finds the the little bit of chili sauce. Yeah, yeah. That just makes yeah. it pop. He'll put he'll put a little color in. It's often um, he's not doing it consciously, but it's often the complementary color, which will just do a tiny. It'll be all blue, blues and purples. Now it'll just be this little tiny bit of red or pink in it somewhere, and it makes it all pop. Yeah, no, it, it's just it's staggering. It's it's beautiful, and, and um, yeah, I from your collective, I have learned so much about color um it's just it's been a, a massive learning experience for me because when I first saw the k-facet collective fabrics I didn't know what to make of them I didn't understand it I didn't get it I wasn't quilting then like I am now and I just I, it was like well, there's so much going on here how do these all possibly work together Mm. But they just do. They yeah, it's do. amazing. Yeah, and the stuff, the stuff, the different styles are so good because, um, as three individuals, we're very different in our styles. And Brandon's um, geometrics and his things like that jumble design of his—they're just so brilliant as backgrounds behind the great big florals and things. Yeah, it's it's such a perfect collaboration and he's his cheeky humor 
comes through. There, yeah. There'll always be something a bit quirky, um, yeah. which I absolutely love. I think he draws from his heart very much. Yeah, um, like that Can Can Dancers one he did. I love that one. I, I, I remember some, some people were quite shocked at that in the Cave Collective group. Were they? Yeah, I remember some people uh, expressing um, quite deep surprise. <laughs> but it was very it did very well and it fits in really well yeah and it's beautiful and if you're fussy cutting you can actually get so many different aspects from from that one design it's it's quite yeah. a clever one actually um yeah it's yeah so you the the three completely different takes um on design it, it just it, it's it's just perfect and, and also we, 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 we're not competing at all either because we're all <laughs> complimenting each other and appreci appreciating e each other's particular talent. Do you think that's the key? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think in a lot of collaborations you get, um, they all start fighting in the end. Yeah, yeah. So the ego can just stay out of it because yeah. you're yeah. in your own way. Yeah, a lot of people, I know, um, it's probably before your time, but when Captain Beefheart and Frank Zappa collaborated, um, Frank Zappa, brilliant mu guitarist, musician, Captain Beefheart, superb vocalist and songwriter, but they both wanted to be the kingpin. Um, it so it didn't, it didn't work. Even they though they out. both had great names. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointing. <laughs> Disappointing. Yeah. We need ours, is a very, ours is a very special artistic collaboration uh, because we, we, we're never squabbling. Yeah. Well, you don't see we each other don't. squabble, which is, you know. We can't possibly squabble at such a this rare, rare meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I, I mean, as a bystander, I just, I feel so lucky to to be alive in an era where there is such talent and not yeah. only that, but you know, a talent that is via social media accessible um, because, you know, as much as everybody loves William Morris, how much, you know, to, to have an actual interview with him. Yeah. I mean, what would that be? It would just be phenomenal. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, gosh, uh, in, in whatever language, you know, he chose to speak at that point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it just, just amazing. So we are incredibly lucky. So yeah. you do two collections for the K Facet Collective a year. I do one, one completely original collection, which is my son. It's normally August. I think it's September this year because of the delays. Mm. And then the February one is recolors. Cave does of older designs of mine. Right. So in terms of painting, I'm just painting up one new collection for Cave a year. And then, how many collections do you do of your own brown snow leopard? For snow leopard, I do one collection. Um. I originally did two collections, but it's actually too much work because there's only one of me. I don't have a studio or any assistants. Um, Kaif has a whole studio. Um, I don't know what Tula Pink has, but I'd imagine there's more people than just Tula Pink in the studio. I think half her family. Um, huh? I think half her family. I think her mum is a manager and her brother right, okay. does um her hardware so all of her scissors yeah. and rotary cutters he helps on that side so it's quite a big collaboration just within her own family let alone anybody yeah, that's, else that's nice yeah so with me it's just it's just me doing it all so one collection a year for snow leopard is perfect i wouldn't yeah. be able to handle two leopard two collections i did do two collections but after Jaftex took it over. Um, it went down to one collection, and Debbie, who's the creative director of Free Spirit, said at some point we're going to want you to do two collections again. 
And I said, no, sorry, I, I can't do two collections. My absolute maximum is one for snow leopard and one for KFC. Because if not, you you just wouldn't be able to enjoy life. You'll just be solidly working. Yeah. There wouldn't be time yeah. to go down to the hedge to look for the badgers or dig up bombs. Or... I mean, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> Um, you live the life my son would love, by the way, you know, yeah. you know, dinosaurs, <laughs> uh, digging up bombs and looking for badges. He'd, he'd be all yeah. over. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, this bit, I, I, I don't know, but I have seen over the last few years, has, in going to one collection a year, has that allowed you more time to collaborate with other companies like Zappy Dots and Odile and people like that? Or have I just made that up? Um, it doesn't really allow me more time because I don't have to do any work for that. It's right. completely... Or, or with Zappy Dots, I love the Zappy Dots thing. Um, they just asked me if, if they could use my work. And all they needed were big high resolution photos. And I don't even have them myself. So they got the photos from Free Spirit. Mm. And I don't do anything. So I just sit and watch it happen. And with Odile, she asked me if I would design ribbons for her. And I said to her, I'm sorry, I just don't have enough time to do the artwork I'm sorry it's a no and Odile said I'm not going to give up that easily if I can have um um digital file files of your designs then I'll arrange them as ribbons would you be happy with that and I said that suits me perfectly I can see some behind you actually and I'm, I'm awake yeah. so I've ordered all of these and I can't yeah. look at that just look at that now these yeah. are velvet ribbons they're velvet they're beautiful yeah I can't wait for mine to arrive so they will be available in the UK which is just fabulous yeah because Odile's, Odile's just launched them yeah nice. I've and placed my nice. order I've got it in it's both my KFC and my snow leopard design. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah. Those are lovely. They're just, what is it? Look at There's that. There's the snow leopard geranium yes. design. I love the geraniums. Look at that. Yeah, they're so lovely and soft. They're like, you'll understand this, they're like a horse's muzzle. Yes, velvet, proper velvet. Velvet muzzle. When you're feeding a horse, when I used to feed Neddy Carrot, you get this sort of velvet muzzle. It just feels like a horse's muzzle. That is just yeah. stunning. I can't wait. Yeah. It should be here any day. So yeah. that's what you're doing with Odile. And um, yeah. so look out, look out for that because that will be that will be certainly hitting hitting my Natasha Bank store in the UK and uh, get them in well in France and in the US as well. And yeah. then Zappy Dots. Well, I ordered all of your Zappy Dot stuff a month ago. It's it's cleared customs. I'm so pleased you're getting Zappy Dot. Yeah. I'll just get the, I'll just get the Minky Top. Hang on. Here's the Minky. Oh, the agate. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah, I wear that quite a bit. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. And I have to say, I've seen Helen um, modeling the uh, modeling the leggings. Oh, the leggings. Yeah, the leggings are really good. Helen wears the leggings all the time. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to look quite like Helen in mine, but I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> for mine to arrive and and also there's um what i lovingly term knickknackery <laughs> what's knickknackery oh there you get the knick 
Yeah, you get the knickknacks with that. Yeah, because they've done they've done little magnets that you can put into bracelets so that you can put your pins and needles and things on there. They've done all sorts of beautiful things, um, beautiful knickknackery with your designs. Yeah, um, they have. And it's somewhere in customs <laughs> on its way to got, me. Oh, yeah. I haven't got any of the knickknackery. I must get them to send me some. Yeah. There's another, there's a Zappy Dots t shirt. Look at that. Just be, that's, yeah, the feathers is one of my, my favorites. Just. They print, they printed favorites. them very well because they're digital, digitally printed. Yeah. But they're really good. There's another feather one. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I'm pleased you're getting zappy dots as well. Well, you know, absolutely. And and I think what we will do on the clothing range is um is get people to order with us and then we'll just get that bulk order in so that people don't have to worry about customs and all that. We'll just Yeah, we'll just that's a really it. good idea. It'll take a little while because it's all a little like I say, I ordered I ordered my stuff a month ago and it's I know it's I, I've paid all the duties and it's it's on its way, but it's been on its way for, you know, a week, 10 days. So yeah. I think that's probably going to be the easiest way. So we'll we'll watch out for that. But it will be in my Natasha Makes store very, very soon because it's it's lovely that companies are, are taking this on and seeing other ways that we can that we can have it in our lives. It's just it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Really wonderful. So what is next yeah. for you, Philip? The next chapter after the COVID years? Um, I never know what's going to happen next. Um, I just sort of trust in the unfolding of life. So I, I don't have a clue. I never know what's, what's going to happen the next day. I just sort of live a, a day at a time, really. Mm. And um, I just enjoy, I love painting. And I love it when the new collections arrive to look at. And I love doing my things, going off down to look for the badgers and the bombs and the dinosaurs. And beyond that, I don't have any ambitions at all. But it sounds pretty idyllic. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and staying up and um, doing battle with, with the broadband. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's nearly two in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we often cross over, don't we? It's, it's yeah. funny, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I'll go to bed soon. You can, you might get a bit more sleep. Oh, but no, thank you. And, uh, and thank you, Dorset's Wi-Fi, for finally playing. It's done really me. well. It's definitely we know this for next time. We do it at two in the morning. There we go job done yeah. well thank you and I, I hope that that next time is is very soon uh, it can be whenever whenever you want to oh philip thank you well i will look forward to having all of your fabrics arrive all of your zappy dots all of your ribbons and i just Excellent. just keep up the good work because you know keep it, doing it. it makes the world a more beautiful place for sure excellent thank you so much thank you Stay safe and all of that. Bye-bye. Yeah, okay, bye. 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 bye.